EcoBuild Symposium today. Um, as you might know, EcoBuild is the biggest uh, sustainable uh, design fair in the world. And um, there always, uh, this year, were, were 800 uh, exhibitors, plus more than uh, 40,000 uh, uh, visitors at Elscott. And um, we were lucky to have our showing our VA as well. So we selected uh, seven um, units and programs to show their uh, variety of the research about sustainability design and approaches. And um, the seven units managed to erect every uh, installation that you see on the image there in only two days. So it was, we had only one week time to erect everything, to show everything and to take it down. So Yusuke is still on site taking down the main structure from Rita, the fiber concrete structure. And um, over the three days, I counted um, each day 2,500 uh, up to 3,000 visitors only on our stand. So we were really busy. I had to ask uh, AA staff to bring still uh, brochures and uh, prospectuses as well. So um, the running order for today is uh, first Claudia Marco from uh, Inter 10, then Dip 2 is Franklin and Ann. Um, dip 16 will be Jonas, um, like the SED would be uh, Simos. Housing Urbanism is Hugo from MTEC, it will be Carola, a former student uh, from MTEC. And the DRL, we will see if Yusuke still make it on time, otherwise we start with the discussion. So the first one, uh, Claudia Marco. Thanks. Yeah, or sorry. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're going to show quickly, I think we have 20 minutes, so we should be a little bit uh, quick, but we're trying to kind of um, explain what is uh, somehow the approach or the take on the on the theme of ecology that our unit is proposing. Um, you probably know already this second year we are working on the theme of eco-machines. And um, basically we started with the idea of, of um, exploring a sort of systemic approach to to design in urban context. So our unit has been working uh, for the first two years in London and um, we've been trying to kind of describe the city uh, in systemic terms, meaning uh, as a, as a multi-layered uh, collection of dynamic systems. And obviously to achieve that goal and to be able to design in relation to that, we have been also developing a series of tools and, and techniques uh, which we've been showing later and that somehow allows us to, to design uh, with this sort of uh, background approach. So, no. yeah, okay, so this diagram is uh, just uh, quickly trying to summarize uh, somehow the idea uh, behind the systemic approach. We've been kind of uh, borrowing from uh, cybernetics and from uh, other uh, background work. Also part uh, of it has been uh, happening here in the AA in the 80s and what we try to extract is uh, somehow a, a kind of definition of uh, where architecture can sit uh, in, a, in a sort of a, uh, feedback uh, loop, uh, which uh, let's say concerns the, the, the behavior, the human behavior and the environment as other two main domains. So what we have been trying to kind of uh, explore is how the architectural uh, device or, or, or machine, and probably we will explain later what we mean for machine, um, actually can exchange, uh, if you want, information uh, with the environment that surrounds it, but on the other hand also establish a, a kind of uh, conversation with, with the user. And somehow what we are interested in is, is to try to, to frame and design the way the flow of information goes from one system to the other and, and how that becomes a, a paradigm that, that uh, substitutes, let's say, uh, control with, with communication. Um, to somehow like um, how can you say, categorize the, the work and the, the different kind of technique used. We've been sort of uh, using this kind of uh, conceptual framework and uh, um, let's say one of the domain is the, one is the domain of the machines and effectively these are the, the sort of architectural devices that we, we've been developing with the students. And um, we can, let's say, find four categories like material system, technologies, fabrications and prototypes which make up the, the sort of machine environment. And um, for example, here you can see uh, like a, a sort of material system drawings uh, from, from a student last year, uh, Kim Bjarke. And um, uh, that is a sort of diagrammatic uh, way of drawing that uh, we normally try to adopt at uh, the beginning of the year. And somehow diagram in this case is, uh, is actually a quite crucial component because allows us to kind of abstract certain logics and to build them into, 
the kind of core of architecture. Uh, fabrication becomes then a, a kind of next uh, stage to, to somehow translate and transform or materialize the diagrammatic descriptions into actual material prototypes. And, and we have been kind of engaging with the students at, at various levels with different techniques and trying to kind of uh, explore uh, some of the concepts in uh, one to one scale, uh, even though with, with small, uh, let's say, furniture like prototype, if you like but uh, definitely engaging with a set of real material processes. Uh, what's happening? Some <laughs> wave. Okay, the, um, the behavior, uh, let's say, domain is, is uh, somehow where the project uh, kind of evolves uh, inside, on site, kind of actualizes on site, and where somehow the prototype, uh, you know, becomes to be really site specific, somehow be beginning to, to load the contextual parameters and, and effectively uh, becoming a kind of uh, architectural machine um, uh, which has a, a kind of a specific relationship with the site. Again, this is the, the project we were showing before uh, which suddenly uh, kind of uh, started to negotiate a uh, site condition. Um, the behavior, let's say, domain uh, uh, incorporates urban scenarios, simulations, regimes and codes. So there are, let's say, different levels uh, or different ways for us to explore the engagement with the context, and uh, one is obviously through uh, drawings, and the other is through uh, the testing of our models. And perhaps here we can show a couple of videos. This is a more kind of digital uh, testing uh, using uh, Maya in this case, uh, the, the flow dynamic. And then um, I think there is a, uh, another one which shows somehow the physical testing. Uh, this uh, project uh, last year from um, Josiah. Uh, working with ferrofluids, in this case, uh, trying to explore uh, the kind of adaptive properties of the material to, to uh, um, change the porosity of a, of, a, of a surface. So he would manipulate the distance between um, magnets to achieve different levels of, of connectivity between the, the ferrofluid material. Uh, do you have the one of water? No? Okay. Maybe show the last one. Um, the, the testing, obviously, we, we actually, at the end of the year, uh, try to exploit the, the event, uh, the um, student festival uh, held here in London, and we proposed these uh, three installations uh, in front of GLA last year, and uh, we're gonna show more in detail later on. But this, for instance, is one of the, one of the testing uh, of, of, uh, of an inflatable structure which would somehow be able to change its configuration and hug people. And that was uh, the, the kind of final experiment. So this one, I don't think we have the video, but it, it's uh, Fabrizio Mattiana, a former student of us, uh, which uh, actually worked with sedimentation patterns, and he effectively built a model to, to test uh, directly the, the, the potential for sedimentation and, and filtration of, of his, uh, his machining prototype. So somehow dynamic processes in this case was kind of engaged with very directly uh, using material, uh, material model. Uh, regimes and codes, again, it's, it's about really um, understanding uh, architecture as a, as a system uh, basically where information flows from one component to the other and, and the flow of information dictates the, 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 the conditions of the system. So in this case, this uh, ferrofluid surface would adapt and, and, uh, and that is a diagram which uh, somehow shows uh, the, the, the various controller. Uh, um, the, the other domain which uh, we, we've been uh, kind of uh, bringing uh, as part of the equation is the, the environment. And uh, again, uh, like subdivided into processes, maps, uh, cultures, and uh, operational fields. Um, this is really about kind of reading the context uh, in which the project is going to, to sort of uh, play a role or, or eventually actualize. And, and um, again, mapping and, and diagramming techniques are, are somehow quite crucial components in that sense. So the way we are deploying them is really to try and extract uh, from uh, the complexity of the urban realm uh, the sort of um, um, systems and processes that we are interested in. So this actually was quite interesting project called Open Aviary, uh, which had to relate with, with, uh, with the uh, fauna uh, in London and uh, kind of looking for different species, cataloging, cataloging different species on one side and, and, and sort of uh, investigating population growth and, and uh, shrinkage, but on the other side, trying to map the network of, of kind of nesting areas in London. 
And this again is another mapping technique um, to understand marshes condition. And then uh, techniques also come from obviously existing cultural methods. This is part of the field trip, probably show later, uh, where we actually had the opportunity to, to work with the um, uh, local uh, people in Titicacale. So, so it's also part <coughs> of the way we read uh, culture uh, through our eco machine. Basically, uh, the way we work with this installation was uh, to go to La Paz and uh, we, we went on the Titicaca Lake and we tried to use a local material and, and re-describe it uh, to design a mapping stall. So through the use of local technique, we, we, we tried to make the students incorporate culture on, on those projects, basically. Yeah, so basically it's the, the, the diagrammatic component of the project uh, is used in this case as a platform to log uh, different type of uh, uh, conditions, like material conditions, but also cultural and technical conditions from the environment in which we, we've been working. So, uh, I wanted to show also... Uh, this is yeah, this was a kind of overview of the methods, yeah. let's say we are deploying in the unit, and these are some of the, some of the projects from last year. And uh, in particular, in the EcoBuild, we were actually uh, proposing the, the sort of material prototype which we've been working with. And so, so last year was a bit of a mix between uh, individual uh, project and, and team project, and always the team project were bringing to the development of a one-to-one of a -one prototype that could be developed very fast, like this uh, Chiminia, like uh, market stall that we did in La Paz, and it was like a, a five-day experiment of which two were done because we, we had to adapt and uh, but but was a quite interesting experiment in which the students were trying to uh, redesign the, the market stall, not with the usual material, with the local material, try to understand whether they could harvest solar radiation to, to <coughs> use it to uh, actually to store it and and uh, and uh, actually acclimatize in a way the the chimney itself. And then another test we did during the, the field trip was instead at the landscape scale. And we were trying to understand, again, at the bigger scale, like some students were working with sedimentation, and at the bigger scale, we were trying to understand how <coughs> sedimentation would work. Unfortunately, we stayed there just two days, so we couldn't have the recording. We, we started to record how the different uh, dimension of sticks according to the different types of uh, the, the water and the filter will provide more or less turbulence, and therefore more or less sedimentation, but we couldn't observe a real sedimentation. Um, okay, this is another experiment, uh, but the main experiment I wanted to talk about was uh, the one in Italy at the end of the year, and is the river sidewalk experiment. In the river sidewalk experiment, the students were like joining in three groups, joining in different parts of their project. And they were um, trying to work at the ecology at different scale, like um, uh, at with different time frames. For example, the open area it was working with the um, ecology with the uh, longer time frame. So the idea, um, different students join together, joining their, their some brought their drone technique, some they brought, brought their material system, uh, some other they brought the, their mapping of the city. What they tried to, their proposal was to work what was called an open area. Basically, uh, in London there is a lot of wild drive, like uh, dirt, fox, etc. but somehow there is um, not a design of the interface between this wild drive and, and, and the, and the, the trees. Yeah, the kind of urban life. The urban urban life. Yeah. And in this case, uh, basically the, the, this, uh, this um, prototype was supposed to function as a kind of portal, if you want, which uh, would connect uh, or would help kind of connecting on one side uh, the, 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 the possibility of wildlife to, to nest uh, in, in public areas, and on the other hand, uh, to allow people to observe and, and interact with these uh, nesting conditions. So. We then uh, went on uh, realizing a one-to-one -one prototype and basically on the form of a, of a kind of a cocoon environment which was accessible to people but had a, a living core. So the idea is that uh, the structure which was made of willow was uh, uh, su surviving and living and would uh, somehow promote the, the, the kind of development of a uh, nesting environment for birds. So all the insects and all the other little uh, organisms that are required uh, for, for a kind of nesting environment to happen. And um, this, as Claudia was mentioning, obviously requires a, a certain amount of time. Uh, we had the opportunity to, to leave the installation on site for 
uh, I think it was one month yeah. almost. And uh, we are have actually was quite interesting the, 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 the possibility to observe on one side how the structure would end up uh, being, like would end up surviving or not, and obviously what kind of uh, uh, species of, of birds we, we would uh, attract. Um, and do you want to go on and show the phases? These are the kind of construction phases, uh, the kind of weaving logic uh, was at the base of, uh, let's say, the diagram for, for the uh, construction of the material. So we would exploit the, the flexibility of the willow on one side. Uh, the horizontal elements uh, were actually used to, to give uh, strengths and to, to create a screening potential to the structure, whereas the vertical member uh, are actually the living one. So they are planted in the ground and they actually bring uh, uh, life uh, to the top part, which is the, the sort of uh, uh, nesting area, let's say. Uh, this is again the construction phase. It's uh, almost finished. Uh, two images of uh, the, the kind of the li living planted core and uh, the kind of nesting area on the top. Um, obviously, yeah, it was yeah. yeah, there is quite interesting process when you go from a diagram to like real material. It's uh, there are all sorts of details which have to be resolved. And in this case, it was quite fun to to try and understand how details could be resolved as simply as possible within the logic of, of the system, uh, understanding the fact that the system needs to be alive in this case, like the vertical members need to survive, whereas the horizontal member uh, are uh, somehow have a kind of flexible moment at the beginning and then they become rigid when they dry. Eh? And this actually is the sort of dried uh, configuration, I think, after a month. Uh, the, the part of the living core were actually still surviving and kind of proliferating. The, the, the sort of the skin is uh, now dry and, and therefore has kind of changed color and onto the different parts. Yeah. It's also interesting to see, if you go on, maybe there's the other picture. Yeah, you see the, the core uh, kind of uh, being, uh, you know, having a hard time, but actually surviving, which is already was quite interesting. It was very hot summer and also the area very kind of public and-, and so uh, Somehow th this year we changed a bit the timing of this type of experiment because what was a bit of a pity is that the we were at the end of the year and so what would be interesting for us is the student not only to, to develop the project and, and the prototype but to be able to record uh, any feedback in the project how this prototype behaves in the real system. Yeah. And yeah. eventually how people interact mm. with it. Like this one is, is yeah, it's more on the ecology and now probably the interactive environment. Central core, it's quite amazing the way it's sort of bent and, and, and can change completely this uh, shape, but with us the last one. <coughs> so, the second project is uh, instead of called the Tidal Garden, and he actually worked on a uh, like shorter time frame if you want because uh, he was kind of exploiting the, the tidal movement of the river, which uh, actually happens uh, twice a day, and uh, the Thames goes up and down uh, around seven meters in that area. So the idea was actually to use it uh, to create like a, a sort of furniture, uh, which uh, would, uh, let's say, create an interface with the, with, the, with the dynamic of the river and allow people to observe uh, and, and, and kind of uh, uh, understand or feel, if you want, uh, the, the by day by day, the, the, the kind of presence, the dynamic presence of the river. And eventually also to, uh, to use the water of the river to kind of power this uh, uh, sort of little garden system. So. Maybe you want to describe a little bit uh, the, the, the kind of core of the furniture, which is this uh, sort of uh, multi-layered bowl. Uh, the idea is that uh, the inside of this bowl there, there, there were like uh, tubes which were going down uh, to into the river with a little valve that would allow uh, the water to be pumped up by the movement of the river, but not to go back down in the river. So uh, twice a day the river would naturally pump the water inside of the bowl and then the water would be released and kind of percolate inside the bulb and reaching eventually the surface which was planted. The, the interesting is also to have a kind of analogic way to, to read the, the characteristic of the river that in this project was not yet developed, but which type of vegetation fit in the, the, the characteristic of the river at a certain point. Maybe you could have mold growing or you can have a certain other type of vegetation. And without having a direct sensor or number that you say, okay, today the river is healthy, tomorrow it's not healthy, dynamic of the water is good or bad, to have instead an analogic system that suddenly would make people in rela in create a relationship between the river and, yeah. and the living yeah, I think one of the main uh, concepts or ideas of, of the eco machine is really the, 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 the communication part. So rather than actually 
a part of, you know, control, uh, whereas we kind of simulate, uh, understand, and then impose a certain solution, uh, really try to develop the systems of communication. For instance, in this case, to allow people in their daily life to, to actually, uh, you know, have a feeling or sense of what's going on in the river in this case, and what can be the influence of the river on, the, on their environment. This is actually <laughs> the, play, the positioning yeah. of the anchor yeah. to avoid uh, our, our system to be dragged away. And uh, and you can see the pipe, and then coming up the, the, the little sort of furniture bench with the. Yeah. Obviously, so now we're starting with radical communication. Yeah. Now in the curiosity of to go and look at the river that at the moment is so segregated that the water is very small because the things are going so naturally through that. Yeah. You know? I think people were well on one side using the bench because there were no other benches, but on the other side also. You know, curiously looking down and sort of thinking about uh, how that would work and what would be the dynamics of it, which I think is one of the kind of main purposes of the, of the idea of the machine in this case. So the last one is the breathing parachute, is the one with the shorter time frame of interaction. Uh, it was like is a kind of inflatable structure that um, was developed by the student, and the idea would be that the, um, there would be a sensor in the moment in which you step on the bay, the structure will hug you, but at the same time being done with inflatable and balloon, it will kind of warm you up in a way. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I, I think in this sense the, the idea was uh, really to create a sort of uh, micro, microclimate uh, around, uh, around people and to the capacity to manipulate this in real time uh, very fast, you know? which obviously adds a component which is not only about uh, the, the sort of comfort condition, but it's also about uh, the playfulness of it being so immediate. Yeah, so it is the, the, the time frame on which you have to step in is what you need to do. Like technically, the system was a sort of, uh, I mean, the idea of this kind of inflatable was derived from an observation of a carnivorous plant. Yeah. And the way carnivorous plants actually manage to contract is by sort of changing the curvature of their surface. And that happens by kind of local uh, effects, so there are no because inches uh, yeah. or no so kind of mechanisms as such. The difference in this case are translated with the difference of length in the, in the vessel, so that when you get inflated, you may not be too broke. The yeah, so that the fabric is basically two layers, the external one being scaled up or larger than the internal one. When inflated, it kind of creates this, this sort of contraction effect. And then obviously, they design the pattern to, to, to kind of operate as a kind of screen and Also, the students were, were trying to devise other systems to interact, like this uh, zip that would allow you eventually people to inflate or deflate, but actually it's the pump that you don't use much. It was just about enough to contract it, but in that sense it was quite successful and, you know, like people were like having it. fun with it, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And obviously the place was really ideal to do this kind of game because there were so many people passing by and engaging with it, so. I think in that sense we were quite lucky. <coughs> oh, oh, it's not visible. Oh no, it's there, it's there. There is a video of on YouTube about all these experiments. If you're interested, you can just uh, type Pico Machines in YouTube and you will get uh, like uh, the, long, uh, the long video, which we did not show it now because it's too long, but uh, it kind of shows the whole story about it and it's quite nice if you're interested to see. I think that's it, no? Yeah. <laughs>
And the goal really is to, in trying to mediate between the cultural and the environmental, is to really bring a new kind of aesthetic and social agenda to sustainable and ecological design. Um, and s for this goal of um, mediating between the cultural and the environmental, we've coined this type of um, technique called environmental ornamentation or a type of flow choreography. The work in looking at the mediation of culture and environment has really looked at the way we can mediate ground um, and ground b using the larger definition of a way of mediating between different circulation systems, internal and external, a way of creating new types of connections between programs that might have already been striated. And thus we're interested in trying to relook at the ground project that was started in the 90s or th that was started with Oscar Niemeyer and ways how we can articulate this ground project to be more environmentally responsive. So rather than just looking at solely the mediation of forces, environmental forces, it's also mitigation of ground and, and people. And thus the, the main goal is how to create this fusion of environment, the natural landscape, culture, as well as infrastructure and architecture. In terms of ornament, we have to kind of qualify the term. Um, we use the word or the definition defined by Nana Rapoport as looking at deep ornament. So rather than ornament being something that's surface-based, um, looking at a definition of ornament that talks about a deeper integration within building systems. So if Greg Lynn used the term structural ornamentation, um, we we're playing with the idea of environmental ornamentation, where the forms that we're using are not only ornamental, but they have ornamental effects. So ornamental effects of wind, ornamental effects of light. But that we also treat an ornamental um, choreography of ground, or ornamental choreography of the way people move in the urban landscape. And that this ground is also mediated for environmental flows. So this is the um, a retrofit of the Parti Communiste building in Paris, where not only is there an environmental mitigation of a kind of exposed facade on the building, on Niemeyer's building, but also a new type of public accessibility um, through this mediation of ground, which is totally lacking. And so the components that are used create new types of steps and ramps, but also mediate light to new galleries and public venues below. So this interest in ground is, is definitely based and inspired by the work, the Brazilian architecture of Oscar Niemeyer and other Brazilian architects who really dealt with ways of mediating between different programs that are otherwise striated with the p internal and external plays of ramps and ground systems. Um, and this type of ground choreography obviously inspired the kind of 90s topological work of from um, REMS Jussieu project to the FOA realized project of Yokohama. And while these new projects of the, in the 90s really used the kind of smooth connections that ground um, could um, employ and, and provide, the physical realization of them had a certain lack of the smaller scale mediation of environmental forces or other types of smaller scale forces. So we're really trying to find a way um, to bring these two realms together, the kind of the ground, the smooth, the monolithic, with the more articulated and smaller scale um, work of the componentry that can mediate light or smaller scale forces. So in the n in later recent, more recent architecture, we've seen this kind of proliferation of components that are um, you know, quite good for mediating light, yet the, uh, the kind of work of the ground has been sort of lacking in this kind of ubiquitous proliferation of components. Um, and so instead of a juxtaposition, we really wanna see a way that these kind of ground and environmental componentry systems can be worked together. While light me component mediations are really highly effective in terms of diffused light. Smooth connections and monolithic systems can also be used to mediate wind, rather something that's sm smooth and that can channel people can also s can channel um, wind forces. And that's looking for ways that we can articulate ground conditions, but also take these ground conditions and make them more environmentally responsive. So Yoon's project, I don't know if she's still here, took the kind of typical component-based project, started to introduce a structural logic to it, and made it so that it could also work as a circulatory system. And so the plays of tension and compression within this um, system allow for different apertures and types of light, but also allow for a new type of bridging over a highway that separated a park in Sao Paulo, Brazil. 
Um, the plays of ground itself can start to mediate different lighting and self-shading and acoustic forces, as in Manos' project in the same park, um, and can also start to articulate both um, in acoustic as well as solar um, systems within this um, bridge system in the Parque Pera Prada. So the work of components is using um, scripted parametric um, controls to really have a driver force within this so software drive or um, control um, specific transformations in the driven geometry so that we have a kind of highly responsive um, component system that's, that's driven within the parametric software itself. Um, and so that wherever the, um, the apertures or the small um, components are located on the relative geometry because of the scripted parametric, we can get this automated responsiveness um, with these types of techniques that control the type of aperture, that control the types of depth to create different types of diffuse lighting. Um, the, look, the issues of components, how components can, environmental components that help bounce around light and, and create different gradations of light can also form structural systems. And also in Manos' earlier project where he was working with the ground, that these grounds can also be articulated with components that take on this multiple performances. So his components here are mediating not only light, but also sound. Um, in a project we were working, we uh, produced in Sao Paulo, it's a sound landscape, it's a rehearsal studio where we use these multiple scales and multiple angle um, roof components to create di of diffusion of uh, different types of sound within this kind of rehearsal space where they need that flexibility to kind of move around the instruments. Um, we use uh, kind of scripted, um, parametric, same kind of parametric scripted system to generate these bris soleil um, for a shop project in Sao Paulo to create sort of a ornamental as well as an environmentally responsive um, facade system. So in terms of the overall projects um, to get the, to really be able to mediate between these multiple scales, um, of course starting with looking at, this is Asako's project, we are looking at the wind conditions and the solar insulation systems to start to design, here's another retrofit project in an existing building, a kind of double skin, double ground interface to mediate both circulatory as well as um, environmental flows. And the, again, another project in the same park, but in a slightly different location, had to use a parametric control for different types of circulatory and ground systems, redefining the kind of building scale shell of Niemeyer to be more environmentally responsive in terms of wind mediation, and then further articulating that based on kind of self-testing of the global um, building scale to generate a system of different types of components. So small little transforma parametric transformations of the component can create different types of lighting effects. So whether it's a, sh a kind of diff totally diffused um, light uh, for the gallery condition or kind of a play of, sh of um, kind of shadows and light for a cafe kind of gallery or cafe um, circulation area. Um, another component, um, parametric prescripted driven component system with Arthur testing reflection within the parametric software itself, um, developed again for the project I showed earlier in the Parti Communiste building for this um, environmental circulation ground that creates new types of accessibility for both light as well as for people. Um, a f another project last year was Charlie's um, project in Parque Vida Prada, so instead of this working on the actual building, she did create a, a kind of a diffused landscape, dispersing the functions of the kind of monolithic um, museum of the Parque Bira Prada into something that much more distributed set of galleries that worked with the landscape. Um, the idea of these um, chimneys that could mediate both light and wind um, were used to define the, her galleries that are sort of, of kind of fully distributed throughout the Parque Bira Prada. And I want to kind of end with this project that we've been working on um, in our with, with Franklin in our office. This is the, um, actually it's a project we worked on with the students when we first started teaching at the EA three years ago. It's the Perizopolis favela in um, Sao Paulo, Brazil. And it's basically a, this um, uh, favela in the middle of a quite posh neighborhood in, in Sao Paulo, in Morumbi. And actually it wasn't, in the beginning it was laid out as a, um, Subdevelopment as a group, as a kind of um, track of houses, track of. But the 
developer probably never went to the site because he just did this huge grid on top of a totally like um, a very precarious environmental condition where it's, there's a lot of um, there's a kind of a huge watershed here and there's a topography is very steep like there's a huge level change between the bottom of the um, valley and the top of the hill so without any regard to any of the environmental um, forces they laid out this um, grid and because it was so hard for the people that bought property here to move in because the city wouldn't, wasn't able to put in proper road connections and infrastructure um, the workers on a nearby stadium right there it's not on the map started to squat, not on the actual property, but on, on the public streets and sidewalks. Um, so the private owners couldn't kick them out, and the city wasn't going to kick them out because they needed them to finish the stadium. So that's how the, the favela started about 30 years ago. Um, today it's a kind of thriving, uh, dynamic favela in the sense that parts of it are being developed and becoming more connected with the, the city, and they have buses and proper commerce. Others are in the south are rather pre precarious and still kind of downtrodden. Um, so we, we've been working with the um, a union, uh, or it's kind of like the an NGO within the favela who are quite organized, and we um, worked with them to propose a project um, to house some of their facilities. So they're currently one of the facilities they have is a kind of literacy school for um, basically people over 15 who can't read and write, and it's. A lot, the majority of their students are like 60-year-old maids who, who can't read or write. They, other, they have other types of programs in the, in the favela as well, but they base, have no facilities, um, and they still have a major in kind of connection problem with the rest of the city. So we worked um, with the Union of um, the Inhabitants of the Favela of Sao Paulo, Union de um, Moradores de Sao Paulo, Carizopolis, and were um, a finalist in the Urban Age uh, competition as we entered the project with them um, for the conference. Um, so this is some of the work of the union, which they've, um, they also, besides the, the literacy schools, they also have um, vocational schools, um, some, some kind of IT training courses. Um, already the city has made some great progress within the favela, like this is a before image of this very steep, precarious site, as you can see, and they built this stair, which is right there. Um, so it's kind of like the before, and they built this stair right here. So we, after looking and studying several sites for this project, we um, developed our project um, as an extension of this city project, which developed this kind of stairway um, terracing system. And so what we proposed was sort of an urban, a terraced urban garden, or community garden system, as well as interior space to house um, some of their um, classrooms and some of their cultural programs, vocational programs, um, and most importantly, a way to kind of connect the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill through stairs and, and ramps. Um, and because we had to change sites so many times, the situation is so precarious in terms of land ownership in the favela, we had this kind of parametric ground system, this articulated ground system that could adjust according to the different sites that we were working and considering with the union. So that was like the first site we used and actually exhibited in the London Festival of Architecture um, exhibit of, at the Brazilian Embassy. And the part of the, um, the steps and ramps were to be shaded um, with these different small canopies and components. Um, and the, the program now um, was finally chosen for this site and um, working to bring about these community gardens um, as well as these kind of properly shaded places for sports and their classrooms. Um, so basically we're working um, to try to create a new type of environmental mediation of ground to bring a new cultural and civic relevance to sustainable design. Thanks. I'm uh, Jonas Lamberg. I'm here on behalf of Deep Six C uh, and also of the uh, former curator for the Environment, Ecology and Susten uh, Sustainability Cluster, Steve Hardy, who is unfortunately not um, here at the AA any longer. Um, I'm going to be quite brief because I, I'm actually not feeling too well, so I'm going to just highlight a few things that we find quite interesting. Uh, it is maybe the way we look uh, at, at our environment. I mean, here you see two sides of the same border and two very different ways of actually looking at the situation. And um, we all know this diagram. We all know this. It's all doom and gloom. Many bad things happen. Some people manage to cope with it in different ways. 
uh, and I just think these things made us made us interested in to ask a few questions about what's possible to do. Um, and a few of my colleagues at UFO, we, we actually made um, a project on Mount Etna uh, quite a few years ago now, five, six years ago, when we, we did a, was an invited competition for a, for a new park that had been destroyed, uh, destroyed in one of the um, eruptions there in 2002. Um, and our I think what we liked was just as architects, we had so little knowledge about the whole problem, about all of the different members that were working on these projects. So our own um, uh, assumption was really this, that it will happen again. So we tried to do a project that dealt with the landscape, it dealt with buildings that tried to do something about uh, the eruption itself, about how you could build in the landscape and how you could actually f affect the flow of lava. That was probably very stupid. In the beginning, everyone thought, you guys are absolutely mad. We just happened to win the competition, and it started a very interesting conversation between lots of people that couldn't speak before. So lots of parties in this project were involved, civil defense, there were volcanologists, geologists, um, structural engineers, um, politicians, all, ki all kinds of people involved in the project. The problem before was that they didn't talk about ideas. They only talked about what was impossible to do. I mean, you can't do that, you can't do this. And just out of our own ignorance, as architects, as generalists, we actually put something on the table that changed the shape of the conversation. Uh, I think this is sort of what we're interested in. Not necessarily, we're not actually gonna show here in the, in the pedagogical work we've done here in DIP 16, we're not interested in, in any particular methodology, any particular type of technique, but we're actually interested to ask a question about how you can position these projects and then appropriate a tool or an instrumentality to work on this. Um, I, I think we, we started with this diagram uh, when we decided to do this, that you know, most of these things are related to the idea of overpopulation, uh, vulnerability uh, for rapidly changing environment, national disasters, and so on, is usually the cause of overpopulation. And we settle in areas that are vulnerable or sensitive. And some of these places are the best, uh, the most valuable land in the world as well, because they're usually very fertile and uh, on, uh, on the coast and so on. So they're actually quite national population centers. So we try to take this situation. Uh, and at the back of the diagram, we just try to see how we can look at these things as architects. Because we have this very naive assumption again, and I think this is the sort of why I'm very excited about being an architect, um, and not knowing everything about uh, everything which is out there, but to act as a generalist, and actually think that we can make a difference as designers and architects. I'm, I know that there are a lot of people with a more cynical attitude, but I think this is the, the sort of power of an idea of, of trying to change and affect the situation. Um, and I think this started uh, the work that we're doing. And again, with this way, I don't understand this equ uh, equation here, really. Uh, I just find it quite interesting because there are certain things here we can't do very much about. I mean, population will increase, um, affluence, consumption, yeah, maybe you can do something about that. I don't know why there's a plus sign uh, in front of technology. Do we have more technology? Does that mean that we have a larger environmental impact? Or does it mean that you can actually do something with technology to reduce that? So I think the, the whole idea of consumption, material, and technology was quite interesting for us when we, when we started this work. And I, at the beginning, we started to look at then w what are these now, uh, vulnerable situations when we actually exposed to these different environments. So we started to look at uh, all of the disasters that happen in the world uh, and how we are actually exposed to these things in a different, uh, in a different way. Um, and ask questions about what can we actually do with this? Uh, is it a question to protect ourselves from this? Do you actually have to live with it? Do you have to change your habit of living or do you have to adapt to this thing? Maybe this is the sort of future contingency, I don't know. I mean, may maybe these are the conditions we have to live through and we have to think about a different way 
of inhabiting and uh, living in the spaces and places. Um, okay, the current measures, I think they're pretty dull and boring. Uh, I actually know uh, the person who actually ran this studio at the DSD, but I think actually the results of them uh, are quite, you know, they, they, there's nothing but design. And we actually wondered if these conditions actually can help us think about the way we work, the way we th look at materials, the way we structure our ideas, the way we actually change some of the conventions for how we build. I mean, this house has two things in relationship to tsunami. It's raised from the ground, so you can take some flooding, and then you can knock all the panels out uh, if it's affected by, by a storm. Um, I think the whole idea about having a, a pitch roof uh, on a volume uh, in a si situation like that is very strange because what you have to do in a hurricane area is to have to go back and reinforce all the junctions in the strength because the weakness is, is where the roof meets the wall. And that's why all of these houses collapse. So some of these things are interesting and our question is why can't you then think about this in a different way? I mean, not necessarily that this is something we're gonna build tomorrow. Uh, but maybe there's a whole, whole idea, other idea about how you can integrate these systems together, how you can actually think what is actually conditioning um, the project or the parameters that, that control the project. And greenhouses can look this way, they could also look like this. I'm not saying that one is necessarily better than the other one. You can also def defend yourself by putting a big wall. You can do like Japan, put a rod, l large fence around you. Uh, or you can actually think about it in a different way. Maybe when these barriers can be rethought as something which is porous, or something which is open, or conceived in a different way. Um, I think this is the other thing, is what do we do? Do we learn how to live with these new conditions? Do we try to defend ourselves from this? Do we try to build higher walls around things? Or do we learn how to build within these new conditions? Uh, and I think this is, has to do with the idea of adaptation uh, that I've, I think we find, find quite interesting. Um, again, yeah, you can live in flooding like this. You have a few extra steps up to your, 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 your ground floor. Uh, and then you can also think about other concerns. I mean, I, I think this is, then when you get into something visionary, it seems like some other qualities are forgotten. You know, like how do you actually deal with an urban space? What does actually this become as cities um, or settlements? Or can they be something quite different? This is Adam Johnston, a student of us from last year. It's maybe not again about something that will happen tomorrow, but this is actually about colonizing the ocean deserts that we have in the world and to try to turn the desert uh, into something, something different. Um, I'm going to show you just a few projects uh, of uh, a range of students, and I'm, I think I'm just going to try to highlight the idea behind this. First one is Dan Marks from a few years ago. Um, he was just interested in the way how you were building quite complex things out of um, clay bricks uh, in India. Uh, the only problem with these bricks is that they gave you very confined, uh, confined geometries, and whereas most of these sites are actually quite often infill sites, very irregular geometries and so on. So he was wondering if you could actually make a component, you could make something that would take you very low skill labor that could allow you to do, uh, for you to use it in different ways. So in this case, it's this grenade shaped um, uh, clay volume. Uh, it has a cavity in it so you can actually store water and it's actually filled with sand so you can also filter water inside. Um, and then you can combine this in different ways. And then I did something there. Okay. Um, and you can actually do lots of different things because of the curvature of this, uh, this component and the way it actually interlocks. Uh, you don't need any mortar or anything, but you will only lock it just like how you did an old Tuscan wall. Uh, you actually lock it with smaller rocks. So there's no mortar. It's only the friction between the aggregate, which is stu stuffed or, um, well, you can say it's stuffed in the cavities between these that locks this in place. Um, I think maybe this is not the most exciting part of the project because I think it falls back into some sort of conventional type, but I, I think actually it's the, 
component and what was possible to do with a simple geometry as in terms of a way of building that I find quite interesting. Um, another project here is about uh, a project on the coast of Namibia. Um, the problem they have in Namibia is that uh, it's one of the driest places uh, on the planet. They do some uranium mining there. So um, uranium mining takes lots of water. So they're emptying the aquifer under the desert. And people live in this desert. Um, and they are reliant on some species with very, very deep roots. And before these roots actually reach the aquifer, today they don't. So there's actually no way that the Topnar people who live in this area can actually survive. So I think this project was just trying to do a mobile structure that can actually use the, I mean, it's a fog collector. This is something that they do already on the coast. But he's, he's trying to actually um, condense water from the, the differences um, of the land and the air temperature and the water temperature because the sea outside Namibia is very cold. So you get these very dense fogs that come in at night. Um, and the whole idea was to try to build this as a, uh, an artificial aquifer by actually charging it by this. I mean, there's a whole lot, lot of other information to it. Um, and a way then of tr trying to maybe, in a way, optimize the way you, you would condense water. And you would be able to get um, quite a significant amount of water uh, from a limited number of fabric, I mean a limited area of fabric. This fabric is just the standard fabric that is actually used for these fog collectors currently. But this is also creating shade so the water doesn't evaporate. Um, another project, this has to do with uh, tsunamis in Thailand. And you, as you all know that the problem there is that they've taken all the mangroves away. So there's no national protection left on the coast. Uh, and it's very difficult to grow uh, mangroves again because there's nothing that protects uh, the trees. And they're, they're quite sensitive, so you have to, th they need to be very protected before they actually take, uh, take root. Um, and I think in this case, he's just actually looking at something would, would be, uh, become some type of armature where the trees could grow in a protected way. This creates a barrier that actually deals with the effects of a tsunami or a larger uh, storm surge. But ultimately, the, the built thing or the cement is filled with seashell. It would actually deteriorate and disappear. Uh, and he devised just a very simple problem uh, system for doing this because he wanted to create as much turbulence, as much surface area as he could. Uh, and he wanted to do it in a, a quite a simple way. So. What this is, is just a fabric casting that you would actually put, uh, you would just dredge up a berm in the water, you would put this fabric over the berm and fill it with concrete. Uh, they're doing some similar things like that, which is called these reef boards that, that they're doing already. But I think the whole idea here was that this is not going to be permanent, it's going to change, it's going to disappear, and it's going to then leave a national protection uh, in its place when it disappears. Um, and I think he had a very nice way of, of actually working with this and developing this. And this is a problem that um, another student faced last year. This is the monument to the tetrapod. Um, and as you all know, like if you go to all of these atolls, all of these um, islands that are usually maybe just a meter, a meter and a half over the sea level, uh, and the Maldives in the near future, well, most of its land will actually be under, uh, under the surface of the sea. The way they deal with this at the moment is that they don't have any national resources, or so they think. So Japan has donated all of these tetrapods. And they've been dragged all the way over uh, from Japan to build a ring around the whole island. And this is what they consider their savior in a way. So it's the tetrapod there is the thing that makes it possible for them to live. Um, I think the whole thing is absolutely, absolutely mad. I mean, what are they going to do? They're going to keep building this tetrapod wall in front of them? Um, and um, this is just an idea. I mean, we don't really know yet. 
uh, what could be done of it. I, I kind of like this because it's trying to use a national process and it's trying to, to make it cyclical. So you actually grow all the materials uh, in an area which would normally then be affected um, by the seawater. So it would be actually destroy the fresh water, lend some of this burn, so you couldn't grow anything there. But it's trying to build a protection by national accretion. So, so this structure uh, is only a very thin metal mesh that you run a, a weak current through. It's very cheap. Uh, and then the structure, the scaffold, is just actually done on bamboo. Um, and it will always build a solid area along the up to um, the sea level. You have to, if you want to build it higher, you need to do it artificially. But this is actually a national process, and you can actually build, rebuild this um, scaffold, and you actually build uh, the same type of protection, but you're actually using the, the minerals in the water. Um, so again, it's just a, it's a totally different way of actually thinking, uh, thinking about the problem in the situation. So the idea is that then this grows and it becomes solid over time. Uh, when the water levels rise. Obviously, we deal a lot with technique as well, and I think here, the interesting thing here is how, by manipulating the two-dimensional cuts of the fabric, that it can affect the global geometry of the form. So in this case, he knew what he wanted to do technique-wise, what, what he wanted to create with this, and uh, got one of the uh, full scholarships to the Smart Geometry Conference last year. So he had a whole team of people, I think Chris Williams and a few guys, working with him to make this possible. Um, and I think that's also, again, the, the sort of power of collaboration, about actually working within different dif disciplines to, to work on one common problem. Uh, and that's something that we try to encourage in our units, that they all have their own researchers, their own consultants, and they go to these things to try to accomplish something. It's not just an exercise, but it's, it's a thing that they, they want to get to. Um, and then we have another project here, which uh, was also at, at the show. It's uh, what I find quite interesting. It deals with fish, uh, fish farms for the fact that we can't farm whitefish. There's only certain species we can farm. Whitefish is very difficult. So what they try to do is to, to create all of these big paddocks or where you actually put all the catch from the North Sea to wait until the prices go up somewhere else. So they start closing off uh, all the fjords in Norway and it has an enormous impact on the environment. So I think Eric in this case, uh, who actually used to work up there, he was just trying to find another way of how you do this, uh, how you can make some more, more porous systems. And uh, I think the beauty of this system maybe is that it's a tensegrity structure. So since it's exposed to waves, um, it all moves. So it has a high pressure pneumatic uh, tube on the outside and then a, a cable counter spiraling in the other direction. And when the waves come in, this will just do this. So you can take any type of impact really from the wave and the moving of the water and it's like one giant spring if you like. Um, and this is kind of how they build the platforms right now. It's all about making them hard and trying to resist the impact of the water. It's, it's a totally different type of system for how you build um, fish farms and, and so on. Um, and then the last product here, it's uh, from Erland. Um, it was the one of the products that was submitted for the silver medal last year. I think he got the SOM award for something. <laughs> SOM award, well, there's lots of money anyway. I, I think that's quite interesting. I, I, what I find very interesting with this, um, it's that it's just highlighting a environmental problem that we're gonna face. And it's that actually the melting tundra uh, in Siberia. And it will be an environmental disaster which is bigger than anything else we've seen. Because the, the total amount of CO2 which is in that tundra, or methane gas, methane gas and CO2 uh, in the tundra, it's the, the quantities are so enormous. So if the whole tundra is gonna melt, which it is doing already, I think it's advanced them with about 400 meters or something a year, and it will go quicker and quicker. So the edge will move, 
And uh, again, this will happen. So he, I think what he asks himself is, can we sort of tap into this? Can we use this for something else? Or how do we actually turn this land into something, uh, something which you can actually farm or use? So it just won't be released this way. So he went to, and this is another thing that we think is quite important, is the way how you go and you, um, you expose yourself to an entirely new context. He ended up in that hotel with a the palm tree there in Siberia. He just selected a city in Siberia, went there, and he met these guys that he, he has sort of met at random. They took him around to show him the Russian way. Uh, but I think what he realized is that there was actually lots of projects that are being done already within this, uh, within this area because they are very reliant on oil, obviously. The, the whole area is this oil industry. And they're already thinking what you can do afterwards. So Erlen had an idea about creating a large, long-span structure that could maybe trap some of this gas uh, that is released. And it's not that you can cover the whole melting edge but you can trap some of it um, and maybe you can use the CO2 and the methane for something else. We can create a very efficient greenhouse. So you can turn peat bog or marshland into farmland in a, in a very accelerated way. Um, and he worked with some of the, um, what they call the, the guys in uh, Eden, at the Eden project. Um, about looking at how, what actually happens with the ground uh, and how can you actually use this and how can you actually store some of the gases uh, that are released as well. So one of the things that this does, it, it uh, produces um, or it grows algae uh, for the production of, of other fuels. It's an alternative maybe to the oil when, when it comes out. But that's because there's such a surplus of gas which is, which is released. And then the other thing is that it will, over a cycle of 12 years, um, it will actually turn the ground uh, on, this, on this edge into farmland by a sequence of different crops. Um, and it has to, it has to do basically with, with, the, with the land as it is right now because it's mainly, uh, mainly peat. Uh, and then after a 12 year cycle, you can then move this to the next area and the land that you leave behind is uh, farmable or, or usable as farmland. And I think it's also asking uh, another question then is what, what you do with these things. And uh, also maybe what this can do as, a, as an environmental device. I mean, in this case, the pressure of the gas will change. And for you as in the model, it will actually affect uh, the, the way uh, the structure, how the structure arches. And most of all, uh, I think, this is the sort of scenario, I think. At the moment, these guys are reliant on importing all of their food stuff from this area. Um, and actually, with a 2,000 hectare greenhouse, sounds pretty, pretty large. That's a pretty large thing. But that's roughly the, the number or the size of the farm that you would actually need to support an area of this with food. Um, and uh, you can also see that, so 2,200, 250,000 Russians, or it could be 2,000 Russians uh, fuel consumption, 50,000 50, of Russians uh, vodka consumption a year. So it's just kind of an interesting relationship of resources, what it takes to actually grow something and cultivate something and refine it into another state, if you like. Um, I'm going to say this last one. This is one of my absolute favorites, is how you turn sand into stone. Uh, this is Magnus from last year. Unfortunately, he didn't get his AA diploma, but it didn't matter too much because he, he won the Holstein Award for Africa um, and was one of the runners-up, I think, for the Global Award for the Sustainability Medal. And this is highlighting a, a problem. I, I don't have too many slides, unfortunately, from this one, but he found this bacteria they can turn sand to stone. And there's this guy in, uh, and they, they never worked out what they're gonna use this for. They think that they could do something in California about liquefaction, so you can stop uh, houses being undermined after earthquakes and so on. 
And Magnus found this thing. Well, well in Africa, obviously the desertification is, is happening so rapidly there. And they're thinking about building this green wall Sahara, which is this amazing green planted area that goes across all of the African continent. So he was actually thinking about how you can build with sand, or how you can build with the desert. Can you in inject this bacteria? Can you actually do something in the desert to actually turn this into stone, to actually make it into a hard, hard landscape building so you can actually civilize this edge? Because the problem with this is that no people live along this uh, green wall Sahara at the moment. And with all of these projects, it works for a few years when there is an incentive to keep them up, and then after them they disappear. So in a way, I think this proposal is to create this as a series of artificial oases across this whole um, Green Wall Sahara to make sure that this is also about civilizing or settling in this area along the edge. Because people are leaving now. I mean, they're just leaving, moving, uh, moving away, and that's what we see in Nigeria, that the cities further south are growing so quickly because all of the northern parts of Nigeria is turning into deserts. And it's happening very quickly. Um, and so some of these things uh, relate, I mean, resulted in, in this book. So one of the things here we're trying to do in this book was to, um, to understand that we all talk about these terms. Uh, environment, in ecology, and sustainability in such drastically different terms. So we did this for the Environmental uh, Ecology sustainable Sustainability Research Cluster. We did these competitions, uh, and the breadth of the ideas and the ways that people work on this, I think was absolutely amazing, astonishing. And almost everyone had some definition about what ecology environment and sustainability meant for them. But almost invariably, they were different. And uh, people worked on them in such a different way. Some people used it as, a, you know, as a, an opportunity to do something else. Some, some people maybe dealt with it in a more technical way. Um, and I just find it quite interesting that we all find it that it's such urgent issues to use for. And I think what I'm interested in, I think it's, it's just Again, this idea about an architect and a designer and the way maybe you, you ask questions in a slightly different way because you act as a generalist. You don't act as a specialist. You don't know everything, but you propose something. You speculate on something. And again, I think it has to do with collaboration and the way it changes the shape of a conversation. And I think that's, I think what we find very exciting in this is the way how collaboration or any sort of joint project can go in a new direction by, by you actually speculating on on ideas. Yep, thank you. <laughs>